As an 8 seed that had to escape the play-in just to make it into a playoff series, the Miami Heat are up 2-0 in the Eastern Conference Finals, stealing both games on the road against the heavily favored Boston Celtics. Eric Spolstra is separating himself from the rest of the pack when it comes to deploying unique strategies, and Jimmy Butler continues to look like a playoff god. But there's also so much more to it. It all starts on the defensive side of the ball with Miami, where it feels like no matter who they put on the floor, that personnel is always going to be maximized. One of their big points of emphasis is aggressively helping to shrink the floor and not let the ball get deep in the paint. Brogdon sets a ghost screen, but Martin stays in the play to show and recover. And when Horford sets another one, Zeller is all the way up at the level, with Martin gapping off of his man at the nail, and Tatum just can't squeeze through the lane. In semi-transition, Max Struess tags Robert Williams, and Tatum thinks he has the middle of the floor. But instead of recovering to Brown on the outside, Struess just camps in the paint to take away a drive. This time, two players close out to Tatum at the top of the key, giving him a lane, and Brogdon's left alone on an island because Butler rotates all the way to the opposite side of the court to take a charge. Through this aggression, they're able to bait the offense into settling for jumpers. Look at where Struess is positioned on the floor, despite his man going wide on the wing, with Butler ready to stunt on a drive to the right giving Brown no comfortable angle to attack, so he just goes to a midi over the top. On this one, Brown isolates from the corner, and Struess heavily plays the baseline because he knows Bam is there to take away the middle, forcing a kick out to Horford that he recovers on with a great closeout, only for Boston to then get a second chance opportunity that Jimmy Butler just erases. They consistently bait ball handlers into rushing decisions like this, with two on the ball and a ton of open space in the paint, Tatum thinks he has an easy lob pass over the top, but here comes Kyle Lowry flying in from the weak side corner to force yet another turnover. The one problem with playing this aggressive style of defense is that if the offense can take advantage, they'll either have to concede certain opportunities or go into rotation but they scramble better than anyone. Brogdon drives hard and kicks it out to White, who attacks a closeout only to be met by three different red jerseys. So he then moves it back to Brogdon, who relocated to the corner, drawing a hard close from Lowry that leaves Tatum open at the top with just one extra pass, but there's Martin right up in his airspace to complete an amazing possession. Here it is again, sending two to the ball off of a ghost screen, forcing Lowry to come up to Tatum on the wing, while Struess recovers all the way to the corner. Tatum wisely cuts, bringing Martin away from the dunker spot, only for Bam to come all the way from the opposite corner to erase a shot at the rim. And that's the thing, Bam's unparalleled versatility at the 5 is what makes it all work. He's parked at the nail to take away a left-hand drive, so when the ball gets swung, he has a long closeout taking away both a three-point shot and an attack with his mobility, before smothering a step back three with that length. He's had a ton of success defending Jalen Brown, this time actually chasing him around the screen and sliding his feet to stay in front of him while funneling his drive into help down low. Because of how good he is in isolation, Miami doesn't have to play that aggressive style of defense when it's him on the ball, swiveling his hips and shifting his momentum to stay attached to Brown like a supersized wing, forcing a pass to the corner that ultimately leads to nothing. This also applies when Jimmy Butler's the one defending in isolation. Brown has all the space he could possibly ask for, and gets to the rim, only to get rejected. When you have this sort of versatility on the floor, along with agile guards and wings who can rotate and recover at a high level, the flexibility in their scheme is off the charts, and enables them to run a lot more zone than any other team. Two go to Tatum on the ball, and Brogdon thinks he has a driving lane off the catch, but when that quickly gets shut off, he picks up his dribble for security, and launches a real awkward floater at the basket. Look at Miami's positioning on the floor, all five players just sunk into gaps, and this makes Tatum real indecisive. 
The ball gets entered into Horford with a 4-on-3 advantage, but Jimmy covers an insane amount of ground to block a corner 3. They're forcing the initiator to make that long-range skip pass to the corner, and this is a real difficult read to consistently make. Marcus Smart has those two defenders up top, meaning there has to be an open man. With Zeller down low and Robinson up at the wing, it's Brogdon in the corner. But by the time he recognizes that, Miami's defense has already taken it away. Again, note how far Martin is away from his man, not giving Tatum any room to attack. And once he picks up his dribble, there's no available outlet because of how they're positioned. That constant aggression and how they continuously switch up their defensive look to keep the offense guessing helps them force a ton of turnovers. Through 13 playoff games, they've averaged about 8 steals, first in the NBA. And so far in this series, that's been up to a jarring 10 and a half. While it is a team effort, I would like to mention that 4 and a half of those are just Jimmy Butler. I could talk for an entire hour just about his individual defense away from the ball. He's not very lengthy, so it's pretty much all perfect timing and unmatched anticipation, baiting passes and taking away routine decisions to just erase advantages as he roams all over the floor. And all these turnovers turn into offense going the other way, again leading the entire playoffs with more than 20 points off of turnovers and 21 through two conference finals games. Despite a lot of their scoring coming as a result of turning defense into offense, their play in the half court is still really impressive. Before we get into that though, I wanna give a quick shout out to Basketball Index for helping with this analysis. If you're not familiar with the site, they provide tons of statistical measurements, tools, and easily accessible graphics. They also offer various different talent grades, and through their player profiles tab, I can easily compare them to other players around the league. Using Jimmy's perimeter defense as an example, on this page I'm presented with various metrics detailing his ability to lock down, along with how he stacks up against his peers. By signing up with the code VENUE30, you can get 30% off your first month subscription, so I'll leave a link in the description below for anyone interested. And with that being said, let's take a look at Miami's approach on offense. Of course they have Jimmy Butler, whose scoring ability, when paired with the patient genius of his attack, allows him to hunt for his own shot seemingly at will. But a lot of times I'm watching, just wondering, how in the world Jimmy has so much room? And that's the result of both an Eric Spolstra masterclass and surrounding him with shooting talent. You've got Gabe Vincent in the strong side corner, with Kevin Love in the opposite, and Max Struess on the wing, who's moving to keep the weak side defense engaged, clearing the floor for a Jimmy and Bam pick and roll, and it's just too easy for him to get to his spot and rise up for a midi. Here's a real similar play, except watch as Struess waits for Jimmy to start his attack so that he can fill out open space in the corner and pull Marcus Smart away as a helper. Then Love and Struess both lift above the break to give Jimmy all the space he needs. When he looks to isolate from deep on the wing or in the corner, they'll overload a side of the floor to clear out, with three shooters occupying the wing and a big in the dunker spot, making it virtually impossible to help without leaving somebody wide open. Here it is again. All other Boston defenders are occupied with something on the weak side, and Jimmy has an entire half of the court to work with, just abusing whoever stands in his way one-on-one. -on -one. This time as he attacks, Jalen Brown actually slides over from the corner to help, and he makes the right read, creating a warm-up triple. When the Heat are making these shots, there's just no way to slow them down. In the Milwaukee series, they shot a scorching 45% from three, and through two games against Boston, they've been at about 44. Not just spotting up, but off the dribble, through heavy contests, and on the move. That last one is key because it unlocks the utilization of more off-ball actions to weaponize that shooting. Both Bam and Love are massive screeners, and although Tatum closes, Vincent's able to knock it down. Here he is again, running off of a Kevin Love pin down, 
but Tatum shoots the gap, so he instead puts it on the deck, driving into the heart of the defense for a little mid-range game. Love's also a skilled enough passer to initiate these actions. Vincent and Struess fill out space in opposite corners to keep the defense moving while Bam screens across the lane, allowing Jimmy to move right into a little elbow fadeaway. Bam himself will initiate a lot of the time, using a down screen to come get the ball near the wing, setting up a screening action that draws two to the shooter, opening up a cut to the basket. They actually run a ton of their base offense through Bam as a passing hub either in the middle of the floor or pinch post, where he can hunt for cutters, shooters, or play the dribble handoff game. Jimmy sets a back screen for Robinson, and Grant Williams doesn't want to switch, creating a real small gap that results in an easy layup. His chemistry with Robinson is off the charts, handing it off to him, getting it back, and immediately hitting him on a cut for two points. And Robinson's reads as an off-ball mover are nothing short of masterful, recognizing that Smart is focused on the ball and not the screen, and shooting backdoor for yet another layup. Much of the value with running through Bam is how he can serve as an ultimate release valve. Nothing comes of this screening action but space in the middle of the floor, and he pretty much has unlimited access to the mid-range. Here he's looking for Robinson in that two-man game, but Robert Williams sinks to protect the rim, so he just uses that space to step into an elbow jumper. And that unique skill set he possesses also enables him to create for himself and others as a weapon in isolation. He attacks Williams down low, and Smart roams over to double, so Butler makes a genius cut to pull Horford out of the corner, creating a long closeout for Martin to attack and get to a reverse lay. Martin's ability to attack off the catch like this and apply pressure to the rim off of Miami Stars has made him an incredibly valuable player for them on this run, and the way that they've fully unlocked him really speaks to how this offense operates. You hear all the time about equal opportunity offenses, and generally those words are used to describe teams that emphasize ball movement like Golden State, Denver, or Sacramento but the Heat under Eric Spolstra take it to another level. With 40 seconds left in a two-point game, I want to know what other team in the league is comfortable letting Gabe Vincent attack Jason Tatum with a step-back midi. Of course, it requires the personnel, and they have that. Pretty much every single player in their rotation can handle the ball, pressure the defense as a scorer in some way, and make smart decisions as a playmaker but I seriously want to know if any other team is comfortable giving Max Struess 30-foot pick-and-roll pull-up threes or Caleb Martin open side isolations. It's almost insane to watch, but it works. And when everyone's in rhythm and maximized to their fullest capabilities, sometimes it just all comes together and you get some brilliant offensive possessions. Jimmy gets to the paint and hits Vincent on a cut, who takes one dribble, quickly moves it to Martin, and relocates to the top of the key so that he can get it right back for a great look from three. This time it's Vincent who initiates the advantage, drawing two in the paint and kicking it out, where a couple extra passes puts the defense into rotation, and ends up in the hands of Max Struess for a triple. So, despite coming into the playoffs as an overmatched eight seed, there's synergy on both ends of the floor. The way Eric Spolstra and his staff know how to maximize every single player on the roster, and some brilliance from Bam Adebayo and Jimmy Butler sprinkled in, leads you to this squad success, only losing three games in these playoffs thus far, and headed back to home court just two wins away from the NBA Finals. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you think of the Heat and what your predictions are for the rest of the series. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.